So just give it a minute. I'm just gonna I'm gonna be here, so no worries. And when when Anthony and Khaled come, they will just come in, right? They will just be you you accept them, right? So that they can come into the room. No problem. So I'm gonna put the speaker. There you are. I'm gonna be here for anything you need. So welcome, Clara. The floor is yours. Thank you. Can you just please send Anthony and Kala the mail because it's strange that they're not here because they confirmed with me this morning. It's very strange. Okay. Well, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the 22nd WOW webinar. And these webinars have been going on, as you all know, since 2020, when the pandemic started. And uh, from January 2023, they became WOW webinars. They were organized by WCA. They are now a co-organization of WCA and IUAES, International Union of Anthropological and Ethnological Sciences, um, which, as you know, are now together under a common umbrella, which is called WOW, World Anthropological Union. And so uh, this is our 22nd webinar entitled Decolonizing Anthropology. I first of all want to thank very much the participants whom I will present in a few minutes. I also want to mention that there was a, um, a seminar on the same theme on decolonizing anthropology organized and held by the Society for Applied Anthropology, anthropology um, organized and which took place on the 19th of October this year. So this, you can think of it as a follow-up for the people who attended that one or just as something new. I also, besides thanking the participants, I also want to thank very much um, my colleague Ricardo Faguaga from Mexico, who is here now and he's the IT man behind it all. Uh, I wouldn't be able to do it without him. And Michel Bouchard from the University of um, Northern Colombia, who is also always uh, in charge of, of IT and, and of disseminating the, the news about the webinar. Um, the ideas of, for these webinars come not only from the WCA, the World Anthropological Union, uh, sorry, the World, uh, the World Anthropological Associations and WOW, but also from the various associations that make up WCA the World Council of Anthropological Association. So we always welcome ideas for new webinars. We also want to um, engage the associations in bringing up names of colleagues that are suitable for the diverse themes that we choose for the various webinars. So please be in contact with us. There's now a a delegate list uh, with a specific mail that everybody gets so we can all be in touch through that and make this work together. So um, the poster and the, and the info page was uh, were both sent via mails, uh, websites, etc. And this is being streamed uh, alive and through Facebook as well. We already have some of the participants here. There's two participants that I'm missing and I'm always worried uh, due to, you know, web problems or internet problems. I will start presenting the ones that are here and hopefully uh, the two colleagues that aren't here yet will show up in the meanwhile. So with this topic of uh, decolonizing anthropology, we have today, um, Michael Rivera from the University of Hong Kong here on the, on the screen. Uh, then we will have Giacobani Cambella from the University of Johannesburg, South Africa. And then, the, then we should have Anthony Redmond from the University of Queensland, Australia, who is not here yet, will hopefully appear soon. And Khaled Furani from the Insaniyat Association, Palestine. Then we will have Hania Solkami, Solkami, I hope I'm saying it right, from the American University uh, in Cairo, Egypt, and Gabriela Zamorano 
from the Centro de Investigaciones de Estudios Superiores en Antropología Social, Mexico. So, I welcome you all. I hope both Anthony and Khaled will join us soon. Uh, I will make a very short presentation of each one of the presenters, and then I will give you the floor, okay? So we will have a first round of five minutes tops each to, to give your ideas, and then we'll have a second round, and then we'll open up to the discussion uh, in which people will participate through the chat. I will ask to all, the, all everyone who joins in in the chat to please write your name and where you come from so that we have an idea of the regional diversity that these webinars involve. And it's always nice for us to get to know other colleagues elsewhere. So please, when you write in the chat, just write, you know, like Clara University of Lisbon, whatever, so that we know where you come from. So um, our distinct guests today are Michael Rivera, a biological anthropologist based at the University of Hong Kong. He teaches courses on the science of skin color, body shape, and genetics, the social construction of race in Asia, where scholarship on this topic is still growing, the history of racism and racial justice movements around the world, and movements towards decoloniality in the fields of archaeology and biologic anthropology. I must say this is, I think, I'm almost sure, the first time we have a biological anthropologist. So you're very welcome. And I think it's very good because we do need this dialogue between the social and cultural and the biology anthropology. Then we'll have Jacan, Jac Jacobane Cambella, who is an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology and Development Studies at the University of Johannesburg. He's the president of the Anthropology of Southern Africa and an elected member of our council, World Council of Anthropological Associations, WCA. He's also the co-author with Dr. Warren Chalkin of the Anti-Racist Teaching Practices and Learning Strategies book. Anthony Redmond, who will hopefully be here soon, has worked in the Northern Kimberley region of Australia with the Nagarini people and their neighbors in Central Australia and in Cape York Peninsula. He's currently a visiting seniors fellow at the University of Queensland after being a visiting research fellow at the Center for Aboriginal Economic Policy at the Australian National University, where he worked on a pan-Australian project on Aboriginal involvement in frontier and intercultural economies. Khaled Furani is a professor of anthropology with WCAA member association in Saniat, the Society of Palestinian Anthropologists. He teaches at Tel Aviv University on the ruins of the village Sheikh Moanas. Hania Solkami is an associate research professor at the, research, the Social Research Center at the American University in Cairo, Egypt. And last but not least, Gabriela Zamorro Villarreal is a researcher at the Centro de Investigaciones Estudos Superiores en Antropología Social in Mexico City. She's also the author of Indigenous Media and Political Imaginaries in Contemporary Bolivia. She's currently working on railroad, railroad infrastructures and indigeneity in Oaxaca and on photographic archives in Mequacan. So I thank you all very much again for being here. Unfortunately, our two colleagues from Palestine and Australia have not shown up yet. Uh, and I will give you the floor. I have sort of thought of two basic questions, which of course you don't have to answer. As I told you in all the mails I sent, this is a very free debate. So you are welcome to bring up your own topics. But I just thought that to organize our ideas, there's two main questions that are the basis for this idea of decolonizing anthropology. The first one is, what is the meaning of decolonizing anthropology for you in as an anthropologist? and in the present world uh, with all the problems that we know exist. And the second one, which is of course directly connected to the first one, is what is the meaning of decolonizing anthropology in your region or in your country or within your community of anthropologists and the relation that you feel anthropology in your country or region has with the world at large. So I will start with Michael. As I said, I always go from east to west just to have an order. So Michael, Hong Kong. 
please. You have the floor and please do not take longer than five minutes so we have time for debate, okay? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much, Clara. Um, hopefully you can all hear me okay. Um, just to introduce myself, I am a biological anthropologist. I'm normally based in Hong Kong where I was born, but I'm calling today from Thailand um, where I'm together with a lot of Southeast Asian archeologists, biological anthropologists. Um, our day-to-day -day work is to investigate human evolution and human development in history. Um, Michael, Michael, sorry, sometimes your sound goes down very much. Do you have, sometimes, you know, you, we we hear you um, kind of very far away as if you, at the beginning it was fine. But okay, then you went, um, no. hopefully it's better now, right? Yes, it is, it is. It's okay yeah. now? Good. Yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Thank you. Um, so, uh, as I was saying, I'm a biological anthropologist, and um, a lot of our day-to-day -day work is to look at the material past, um, human remains, and also artifacts from archaeological investigations, so that we can find out a little bit more about um, past people and how we've um, developed into the human species that we see today. Um, what does it mean for me to decolonize? You know, I especially learned about these um, dialogues and discourses when I was doing my PhD between 2015 and 2019. And I realized, um, I came to realize how important it was that I was the only one from Hong Kong uh, pursuing such a PhD in this field. Um, I think that what I would often run into was seeing the world in a certain way where Asia and especially East and Southeast Asia was my center, but um, all around me in the West, where I got my PhD, um, especially at the University of Cambridge, where um, it's like I felt like I was in the heart of empire, where um, there was a certain canon about human evolution and the narrative of who we are as humans um, had to had to fit like I had to fit their canon I had to fit in the way that they would um uh, think humans have developed over time and they wanted me to treat the west or Europe as my center but it, it never was going to be because I, I grew up on the beaches of Hong Kong and um and so what you do see actually um nowadays is a lot of scholars around the world especially the global south and Black, Indigenous, and other scholars of color um, in the West interrogating those narratives of human evolution because they actually hold a lot of colonial, racist, Eurocentric biases. And we need to incorporate um, more inclusive um, and especially more Indigenous perspectives in the interpretation of the human past. A lot of us uh, also are now contending with um, the fact that our field is, is quite a fast moving science as well. And um, for instance, we will study how genetic diversity in Africa is the highest. And as we move around the world, um, we see genetic diversity go down. Um, and this happens because smaller groups of humans in the past moved away and that smaller group has a, a lower genetic diversity. The more that you grow, um, the more that they move around the world. Um, and this is a very nice, neat narrative, I think. Um, but when we actually look at population structure of the entire species, I think that there are more important questions to ask. Like, what about the impact of the last 500 years on, on, our, on our genetic gene pools, on our biological self as a species? What about the impact of slavery and genocide on genetic population structure? What about, um, you know, anthropogenic climate change, which disproportionately affects um, those on in, in the coast and especially in, in the developing world where vulnerable populations are also dying en masse. What about the impact of, of the last 100 years or so of um, conflict and resource exploitation? Um, um, though we are, a lot of our countries are decolonized, um, or we have gained independence as nations, um, I think that a lot of the time you know, we still live the legacy of um, that colonial period. So what actually, what is the impact then on our on our health? What, if, what are the long-term impacts of all of that um, uh, sort of uh, marginalization and uh, lack of access to resources? There are now studies prioritizing 
uh, that especially looking into global South indigenous and black health um, and how the body has responded over the centuries to um, these things. I think also in Asia, um, you know, the second question is about how it is in our region. We are definitely contending with, um, you know, the, the colonial legacies uh, in our fields, in archaeology. It tended to be very white or European dominated in the past, um, while also contending with new nationalistic agendas and narratives of our um, many governments in Southeast Asia and in South Asia and in everywhere else um, in, in my part of the world. So, um, you know, when when we pursued science as, as younger scientists, we wanted to find out the more objective truth about how we've evolved. And so a big challenge uh, for us is that, you know, a lot of science is not apolitical, it's quite political, it's quite social, and though we might try to do our best to do um, accurate, reliable research, um, people take our data and they will um, misuse them in all kinds of ways to um, promote their own agendas and promote their own narratives. So I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Michael, both for the input on, on something that is for many of us new, the, the biological perspective, which is of course very important, especially also the connection with the anthropogene and all that, anthropogene, sorry. And, um, and also for the input about what's happening in your region. <laughs> so I will move on to uh, Giacobani, uh, please. I've, I've, can you, uh, the best thing I think is if the others, while one speaks, we turn off our mics so that it doesn't interfere. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thank you so you much. Uh, thank uh, you. Can you hear me? Fantastic. Okay. Um, thank you so much uh, for this invitation and thank you to everyone um, joining online um, and thank you to my colleagues. Um, who are here. Um, it's really wonderful to be here to really um, start thinking and meditating on this notion of um, decolonizing um, anthropology, or as I think I will try to provoke if it's even possible um, to decolonize um, a discipline as this one. Um, it was very really tough to, pre to prepare for the presentation because there is no presentation and there is no brief. So essentially we're given free will um, to start with um, so there's two ways in which I thought to approach um, this topic of sort of decolonizing anthropology. And the first one was sort of to look at um, sort of outward. So all the kind of structural issues that we face in the discipline um, that, are, that, that are quite important. But also secondly, I thought maybe to look inwards. What am I actually doing towards contributing to um, the decolonization of this discipline? And so my sort of reflections today are going to focus largely on the second part. Um, I thought I want to really reflect on my own self um, and my own role um, in the discipline, uh, particularly as a young black male um, in a discipline that is still largely white um, and male, um, in, particularly in Southern Africa. So um, just to share a personal story, until 2007, when, and in my first year at university, I'd actually literally never heard um, of this discipline. I'd never gone um, to particularly good schools where there was a lot of career guidance. Um, it wasn't until there was a black woman, um, forensic anthropologist Clay Kef, um, who wrote a book called The Bone Woman, um, and we were invited to a talk of hers at the university. And she was writing about her experiences as a Black woman, forensic anthropologist. And when I was listening to her, I was always like, oh my goodness, this is what I've always wanted to do. But I didn't even know this discipline um, exists. So that's how I literally came um, and heard about the discipline. So in my work um, since 2007 and nearly, um, I I think I'm showing my age, nearly 20 years now um, in the discipline. I've had a lot of experiences, um, some good, some negative, and a lot of these have forced me to really think about three areas that I want to reflect on. And the first one is existing colonial impulses um, in the discipline. So that we know, particularly in the African continent, that anthropology was central to the colonial project and that it was um, used literally by um, colonial governments as a part of the colonial project. So one of the first questions I always ask myself um, in the discipline, what are the sort of um, remains of, of these colonial co colonial impulses 
and, and how do we start to address them in the discipline? And then the second one is really this question around, um, um, all of us have heard of this notion of exotic others, how people like me have historically been written about in the, in the discipline. So how does it, so part of what I'm reflecting a lot on at the moment is what does it mean to also to be the colonial, sorry, the exotic other, but in some ways a contributor to the ways in which um, people are written about. And then the last sort of reflection is around the question of authority of um, the authority of, of 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 authorship. So who has a right to write quote unquote um, around the other? So in here, I just want to reflect shortly on one research project that I have. I never know how to place myself because um, I'm, I'm not necessarily a medical anthropologist. Uh, my work doesn't only fit in cultural anthropology, doesn't fit in the anthropology of education. So for the purposes of this, I want to just reflect on one research project on researching um, Tosa men as a cultural insider and some of the issues that that has brought up. So in, the, in this project, I'm both a cultural and linguistic insider. Um, and I'm aware that this places me in a, in a, in, in a tough position in that I'm both um, the nexus between colonialism as well as the production of anthropological no no knowledge. So as a Black Kosa young man researching predominantly other Kosa young Black youth, I've often wondered deeply um, as other scholars um, when writing an anthropology, if this discipline can really ever be um, decolonized and it, if we can ever use it for decolonization purpose, purposes. And I want to be optimistic and actually answer yes, that it, it can be. And I think an important part of decolonizing anthropology requires a, re a rethinking of epistemology through a decolonizing movement focused on epistemology that provides rigor to a multiplicity and a plurality of voices. This is important because as, we, as I've already spoken about that anthropology arose from colonial impulse, impulses where knowledge was used to recreate systems of control so by really starting to address the problem of authority of authorship, we can really start thinking about seriously about um, the authority of ethnographers to write about other cultures in contemporary ethnography. And an important part of addressing this issue of ownership is to move away from the treatment of fieldwork data as only material that needs to be refined and created in some sort of as some sort of commodity. Um, as um, Williams and Harrison write, that if we can get away from the model. Um, which um, which is consistent basically with the market, capitalist market, commodification, competitive individualism, hierarchies, and whether we real sorry, and realize that the people who make um, research possible are as much like us. They have knowledge and sometimes very sophisticated understandings of the world. And embedded in these knowledges are what we call theory. So there is a possibility to ground what we do in anthropology, to really situate that inquiry in what we do in the real worlds of people and really decenter ourselves as anthropologists enough so that we can absorb and speak with rather than for or whomever that we speak with or that we research. Um, so, um, sorry. Um, and this is one of the most um, sort of democratizing and decolonizing ways in which to sort of um, start decolonizing anthropology. So we have to start making um, one of the things I'm trying in my work, in, in all my writings, I know some of my students are here. So I'm trying different forms of approaches of really starting to, to, to think with rather than to think for. Um, and one of the ways in which I've done this is to really think about inserting local narratives in ethnographic texts. So in a lot of my writings, there's always three voices. There's the scholarship, of course, there's my voice, and those are always the voices of the participants. And I think in centering local narratives and the narratives of those that we think with, um, we can assert that the people under study are also capable of theorizing their own conditions and situation. This does not necessarily mean downplaying um, the role that we have as ethnographers, of course, as the authors of often a lot of these ethnographies, um, but it means that, and, and the power that we often have. But despite these power dynamics that are often involved in ethnographic research, there's always potential for a praxis of care in the work that we do and a praxis of humility through ethnography that is lived and embodied in order to avoid ep epistemological imperialism and apartheid. So I write always in my work from a premise or, in, or I teach from a premise that people have their, this, my students or my interlocutors have also capacity as bell hooks write about for, the, for capacity for textual experimentation through engaging in their own critical thinking and their own lived and embodied realities. Um, so just, I know I'm, I'm probably have one minute left, um, but as um, Leslie Bank has already written that 
historically, you although you don't have a minute left, Kobani, okay. but you will have five minutes afterwards. <laughs> Your time is okay, up, okay. but please go okay. ahead, finish the sentence. Okay, I'm almost done. I'm literally on the on the last paragraph. Um, so as um some um Southern African <clears throat> scholars have noted that although anthropology in Southern Africa has a history of being racist, um, in fact, um one of my closest friends, um Dr. Tlaleng Dr. Tlaleng, um 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 has written that anthropology actually cannot be decolonized because she feels that it's too racist and that it has to be abolished. But um, actually anthropological, um, some anthropologists in Southern Africa have actually contested this terrain that it's not possible to decolonize the, the, the discipline through showing the ways in which in, his, in historical terms, um, Southern African anthropology um, um, has never historically had conservative approaches to scholarship. Um, um, as innate in the discipline, it's although it's not it's noted to be notoriously notoriously white and racist in the scholarship of quote unquote natives, um, um, but we've noticed that, for instance, um, Leslie Banks, who studies the University of Fort Hare, that historically in the 1940s and 1950s, um, anthropological anthropology departments were actually not white um, in Southern Africa and were heavily supported by black students and staff. Um, he argues that um, in Southern Africa, diverse groups of people, including women and men, black and whites, Jews and Gentiles, together with Africanists, communi communists and liberals, were all central actually to the formation of anthropology in South Afri Southern Africa. Um, he writes that it is precisely this social and cultural diversity at the birth of the discipline of South of anthropology in South Africa, that is its greatest strength, especially in the context of history of other disciplines on the continent. Such exceptional diversity as the one that we see in anthropology exists in no other academic discipline in South Africa or Africa more broadly, perhaps with the exception of theolo theology. And that's why it remains a great intellectual asset for social anthropology as a dis discipline. So as a young black man, um, how I define um, my uh, anthropology is really through um, a scholar called Tamiseng Motseme, who argues simply that anthropology, sorry, decolonization is a new way of seeing. So in my work and my research and my teaching, it is this diverse um, and inclusive anthropology that scholars as Bank and others have written about that gives me hope in the discipline um, and that I would like to contribute my scholarship. And that makes me optimistic that there is hope of actually decolonizing um, the discipline. But I'll stop there. I know I'm way over time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, you did take <laughs> much more than five minutes anyway. But it, it's just that I, I, I suppose you are aware you will have five minutes afterwards. I just do it this way so that we have time to debate otherwise. OK, so thank you very much, um, Chikobani. And now we have Anthony Redmond from the University of Queensland. I think Anthony finally joined us. Hi, nice to see you. Hello. We started without you because we can find you or you can find us, but I've presented you, I've read your short bio note, and thank you very much for participating. Uh, we have been, uh, we are having a live stream and being transmitted through, of course, Zoom and Facebook. And Anthony, um, as I asked everyone, I would like you to, you know, just draw out a few uh, first comments, five minutes tops, and the questions I raised were very simple what is decolonizing for you and what does it mean for anthropology uh, uh, in your region your uh, country in, in your uh, you know uh, social cultural environment thank you yeah. you thank have you the floor well. yeah thank you so much oh we can hear you very well uh we can hear you you your sound is off uh, it's... can you hear me now How's yes that? yeah okay. we couldn't hear at all before it was like you were in australia <laughs> Well, yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Clara. And um, thank you, Kabani. Um, I couldn't agree more with your uh, assessment. And um, I'm looking forward to the engagement that we have um, subsequent to this. But um, our, since our, you know, our common understanding of colonization is as a structure of institutions, ideology, everyday practices, um, I I very much agree that decolonizing anthropology as a discipline is is not possible without the uh, our collective action of working towards decolonization of the world that we work in, and perhaps somewhere there 
lies the negation of the negation of um, of a colonized anthropology. It's able to speak to the colonized world in which we live and work. Um, so obviously, this is a huge project. If I'm talking about, with, well, we're aiming towards the dismantling of racial capitalism on a global scale. That's not to say that we cannot make inroads into the discipline of anthropology. And in my experience of uh, 30 odd years of working with indigenous people in Australia, it's actually my interlocutors, it's the people I work with who do the bulk of the work of decolonizing my presence, decolonizing my work, decolonizing the way that I think and see with them. And, you know, there's been a lot of talk in the past, a lot of writing about the fragmentation of the anthropologists immersed in the field situation. Um, and I think that's a very valuable part of our work. Um, I found that the most important elements of my engagements with Indigenous Australians is the inducement of me into a of a relational self. My engagement with the people that I work with is um, it's an attempt to create, to establish me in a relationship of reciprocity with the people that I work. And I see that as being the major thrust of the decolonizing dynamic um, of working as an anthropologist. You know, in a very practical sense, my work is uh, over the last 30 years has been orientated towards the reclaiming of indigenous lands um, through um, collective research with, uh, with the people I live with in this um, small community spread out through the Kimberley region. Um, and taking that work um, into the legal system um, in order to uh, satisfy the criteria of the state for um, the settling of um, Aboriginal land reclamation. Uh, and so that's absorbed a lot of my attention. It certainly wasn't what I had imagined when I first went to the field in the early 90s. Um, but having spent five or six years living in those communities, on a PhD project, uh, my indigenous hosts let me know very clearly that having spent this amount of time in educating me in the, the nature of the world and their relationships to land and to each other, that it, it, wasn't, it wasn't appropriate for me to then um, parachute out of that world and return simply to the university and establish a um, a, a long, ongoing career within academia. Um, so basically, it is a form of induction of the anthropologist um, into a different way of seeing. And because our, our very methodology um, hinges on that, um, I've found that I can work together with people on very practical projects. Um, so that's included, as I say, land claims, engagements with the courts and the legal system, but also in, um, in research for uh, uh, compensation and reparations for enslavement in pastoral leases and um, on Christian missions. Over the last um, over the last century or so, so um, they're the kind of practical projects that build build trust, and they're directly aimed at um, even though even though it also implicates people even within the state within the colonial state, in as much as people have to engage with the courts and legal systems. Um, but at the same time, it works as a as a critique of the, and as a 
a deep questioning of the colonial state. Um, and when, I, when we come back to have the second conversation, I, I'd like to talk a little bit more about that kind of um, that kind of radical realignment of the self that's required in order to decolor to be decolonized by my interlocutors. So I think I might just leave it at that point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anthony. I'm glad you made it and you joined us. And now we should have Khaled Furani from Palestine, but he's not here. We don't know what's going on. There might I don't know if he's in Palestine, so there might be some energy cuts. I don't know what happened because he wrote to me this morning confirming he would be here. But anyway, so we'll move on to our next guest, Hania Solkami, American University in Cairo, Egypt. Please, Hania, you have the floor. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Clara, and thank you, colleagues on the panel. I I, am, I apologize, I have a really bad cold. So if that comes through, at least I'm not contagious, as far as you're concerned. <laughs> that hasn't happened yet. But um, so let me be a little bit contrarian um, and start from 1991, when with colleagues, our first publication was called Anthropology and the Call for Indigenization of social science in the Arab world. And back in the 90s, what we call now decolonialization, we called indigenization. So, but there's a difference. There's a very big difference between the two. Decolonialization centers the historical experience uh, in the production of knowledge and indigenization centers the output of knowledge and its relevance. And I think that this um, the, um, distinction is really an important one. That it's, it, it, so is it an effort to make anthropology more relevant to its participants and audiences, or is it an effort to center the anthropologist and her and his peer-reviewed journals and, uh, uh, you know, uh, competition for grant money and, and center a historical experience in a way that has kind of cast a hegemonic fudge on this issue. We, uh, I mean, the science or the, the profession, our métier, our, our, our industry. And back then we were talking about the struggle against political hegemony. But we really need to, to define those two words. What is hegemony now? What is its teleological objective? What is its end? You know, what is this colonial, you know, white whatever project trying to do? And also problematize struggle. What are we struggling for? You know, we're struggling to do what? To, to, to realize what? And I think that these definitional questions are um, important. And I have four areas where we can look for answers about what is the struggle and what is the hegemony and what is the contest. And, and of course, the first is analytical criteria. We know that when we talk about decolonialization, we're talking about as uh, Michael and uh, Kobani and, and, and I think Anthony to some extent have been talking about the analytical criteria that we use to create this knowledge, to discern the contours of this world in which we're engaging, to define what's what. Okay, the second place is about field representation. Who do we study and who is occluded? You know, and, and, and you know, what, what space we give to who in the fields that we study. And this is you know, part of the conversation and I'm sure we, we, we're all familiar with these uh, issues. But there are two other areas that we, I, I feel very strongly we need to look at to understand this trend. One is output. When, what is the output of this process whereby we go to the field and give voice and space and, you know, kind of be fair and, and be humble and then use analytical criteria to, to convey this uh, humility and this uh, sensitivity, but to who? And this is really a crisis um, uh, 
in, in anthropology, I think. The way we, we describe what we do, so it's the output, the way we write it, we are completely at the service of the hegemony of a language, an argot, a complexity that, you know, as, as an English speaker and, and as someone who also understands French, I, I, I feel sorry for people when they agonize about concepts that don't even make any sense in Arabic. So if you're writing about, you know, gender in the Arab world, then you're really agonizing around you know, it's this, but not that. It uh, it doesn't make any sense in 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 my language. So there is this the language and conceptual framing of these outputs. Who are they for? And and that relates to the other thing, the audiences. I mean, we we cannot connect to audiences beyond a a, a, a narrow a peer group. I think no, we can't even connect across disciplines sometimes. So. I think there are the responsibility is on us to problematize this the hegemony of the standards, the language, the outputs of the discipline, but also to be very honest about the relations and costs of knowledge production. I live in a part of the world where we have very narrow and, and, and scarce access to the field because we have a, a policing of the social, we have to have licenses and, you know, and also, so, so field work is, you know, can be hazardous, but it's also difficult. And where there's no money, um, basically, because let's face it, we all need money to do whatever we do, whether it's money to do the field work or to make an income or to, you know, or grants and, and, and salaries and so on. So I think it makes me um, very, I mean, makes me self-critical of this, the cost of being pedantic, you know, the cost of being careful and pedantic. And it is the opportunity cost of producing anthropology uh, in this uh, careful way is so high that that in itself is a kind of colonialism from the back door. That is an, an anti-reality uh, 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 process, I think. And, and also it makes, it's quite intimidating. It's very intimidating for students and for younger people who feel that they have to talk in this way and write in this way and problematize, more importantly, problematize. You know, like you have to find the problem that qualifies as an anthropological conceptual issue that is interesting enough. And I'm almost done. So what, so, you know, is silence an option? I don't think so. Is just being applied and practical always a solution? I don't think so is just saying to hell with it and I'm going to, you know, publish in whatever, you know, American anthropology or American ethnographer or whatever, and who cares? I don't think so. I think we really need to be uh, keeping lots of balls in the air that it's incumbent on us. So for me, this project, this decolonial project, this this indigenous project is an, eth is an ethical one, but also a readership one. So the, the onus is on us to try to stay relevant to so many different audiences and through that um, relevance to change the field. I, I, you know, I don't think that the luxury of navel gazing too much is useful for anyone except us. We keep thinking about ourselves and who am I and what am I and, blah, 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 and uh, you know, um, but that that's also, yeah, I mean, um, I, frankly, quite frivolous. But also being sucked into practical that you know I have nothing to contribute. But but I I respect what what Anthony said. I mean that having some kind of of practical purchase to uh, the spaces where we work is important. But it, but it's also not enough. I think that what we need to decolonialize uh, is the anthropologist's output. And not the uh, the the science per se, or or the um, you know what we do in uh, in fields and what we research. And I'll stop here. Uh, Anya, thank you very much for your input. So the next one would be uh, well, we we still have Khaled Furani left behind, but he didn't show up. So we'll move on 
to our well, last but not least guest, uh, Gabriela, Gabriela Zamorano from the Center of Research and Superior Studies in Anthropology, in Social Anthropology in Mexico. Please, Gabriela, you have the floor. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Clara and the organizers for inviting me. It's it's really uh, marvelous to, to be listening to, to you all. It's, uh, it's a very relevant conversation and debate. And uh, well, I am a, a Mexican scholar um, um, working on images. My, my, my craft is mainly images, film, photography mainly, uh, and images produced within anthropology, but also images produced as part of the, of the, of the political and social life. Uh, I, I, I work based in Mexico, but I, I also had the opportunity to to work in Bolivia and in other places of Latin America. So this is, um, this has given me, uh, you know, like a kind of a panoramic view of what's going on. And uh, in, in this field of mainly um, indigenous film, indigenous media, uh, um, the history of photography, racial photography. So through through images, I've been able to, to analyze kind of political struggles, uh, questions of violence, racial violence, racial histories, and uh, who and to 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 interrogate, like to to raise some of the questions you, you've raised, but in the field of images, mainly who is producing images, how are they producing them, uh, what are images used for in, in in the social field, how do they take place of uh, in struggles, and. Um, uh, in that in that area, I've realized that uh, at least in the I don't know three last decades, uh, the field of uh, representation, visual representation, has been very contentious. Uh, has has been very active, and uh, as in anthropology, we see that there are many other. Uh, it's kind of liberating itself, you know, against uh, uh, representation of uh, initial representations of. Uh, uh, indigenous people, for example, in early uh, 20th century, uh, compared to what is being produced now in terms of who is like a lot of indigenous people producing their own images, their own histories. Uh, it's it, it's really uh, uh, relevant to see what's uh, uh, how how this uh, field of representation has 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 has, that, has advanced, and um, for me, one one of I I, I find that very, you know, contradicting, contradicting field because on, one, on the one hand, you have uh, this very heavy colonial uh, history within the discipline, but at the same time, you have very liberating methods and possibilities. So I think uh, uh, ethnography nowadays is a, is a, a field uh, where you can open to listening, to, uh, to dialogue, to collaboration, to analyzing processes. Uh, to analyze also fissures and contradictions. I, and I think um, this possibility of ethnography is really through, also through very interesting methods that, you know, have been within the field for uh, throughout its history, but that nowadays are uh, very creative. You know, I, I, I focus a lot on methodology, working with students, working in my own research. How can we uh, push methodologies even uh, beyond the field of anthropology itself, for example, in dialogue with uh, artistic representations or uh, curatorial experiences for, for example, organizing a, a collective photographic exhibits. And how can those methodologies help uh, uh, contribute to, to, to opening the, the languages of, of anthropology, to opening the voices that uh, are being represent, pre represented within anthropology, and even the the ways, the visual ways in which uh, uh, anthropological subjects and social subjects and political subjects uh, can have a, a stand and, and, uh, and a way of uh, 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 expressing themselves. No? So uh, I, I would I would like to um, push the question of how methodologies that take place in, in terms of discursive. Uh, 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 expressions, but also in other kinds of expressions like performatic, material, visual expressions, can uh, uh, can help the colonizing uh, or 
uh, opening other possibilities in terms of power and uh, representation within anthropology. And I think uh, uh, maybe that's some that's a question we can continue exploring together with the, the questions you all, you all have raised. Uh, I I would finally like to 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 point out uh, some of the reasons, uh, at least in, in in my region, but also I think it's it's a global uh, risk when uh, talking about um, uh, the uh, like the, the colonizing anthropology, and I think we should be very careful to avoid um, uh, essentializing identities. You know that. Uh, very important to 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 stand for for uh, uh, including and uh, um, contending voices uh, within anthropology. But I think we should be very careful uh, against uh, essentializing and pushing identities by themselves without uh, detaching them from their historical contexts. And I think. That's um, that's one of the risks that I find sometimes when we stress so much the question of uh, 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 the colonizing uh, processes that sometimes we prioritize uh, the, the, the identity by itself and detach it from the historical and even the, the internal questions, the, the internal tensions within mm -hmm. specific communities. And that uh, uh, puts another risk or uh, establishes another risk uh, uh, for, uh, you know, uh, uh, overlooking power relations and historical relations that have that constitute a specific uh, uh, identities. No, so that's that's. Uh, I totally agree with um, some of the of the of the questions that my previous colleagues established. For example, in terms of audiences, no, who, uh, who are we writing for? Who are we producing knowledge with? Uh, in which languages are we producing language uh, 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 knowledge? Uh, how uh, are conversations uh, 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 coming out in anthropological products? And even what is the form of our uh, products? You know, are we continuing uh, uh, using an anthropo a very academic jargon, or can can we use other language, other other languages, and other aesthetics in order to 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 open the possibilities for for producing knowledge now. That's, that's it. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Gabriela. So we've, we're done with the first round. Unfortunately, our colleague Khaled Furani from Palestine hasn't come around. I don't know what happened. It's too bad because I really insisted on somebody from Minsiniat, from the Palestinian Association, to be here, especially due to what's happening in that area. But well, we don't know what happened. So this was the first round, and as you all heard, it was already so rich that we have so many subtopics uh, addressing this issue of decolonization from uh, Michael Rivera's contribution uh, with his biological anthropological view and questions like uh, the impact of slavery and genocide on, on what we do today as anthropologists, uh, with Giacobani's idea of how do you place yourself as an anthropologist as a black male uh, working in academia vis-a-vis -vis, uh, people you work with. Uh, and then to Anthony Redman, and uh, once again, the issue of engagement with the people you work with and, and the questions that have always been raised by our discipline and that are now very, very straight to the point on, on methodology. And then Hani has several ideas on, on the issue of language, which is something that, for instance, WCA has fought very much for, which is to go beyond the hegemony of English and the, the, the English-speaking world uh, with, with things that we do, like uh, the déjà vu, like in sus propios términos, you know, trying to, to have people work and, and, and present things in, in different languages, in their own languages, and, and that's also a way to engage the people we work with, because Often the people we work with won't read what we write if we write in English. And then, of course, the problem of audiences. And then uh, Gabriella um, dwelled on, on several issues. The, the, something that I find very interesting, the, the issue of the, the dialogue of anthropology with artistic experiences, but also the big issue of avoiding uh, essentializing identities and, uh, and, of course, the main issue, I think, that brings up the the theme of decolonizing anthropology, which is the importance of 
our own historical contexts and how do they relate to one another. Now, this was the first round. Besides all these ideas that I tried to sum up now from my notes, but it's been so rich, we already have a lot of questions on the chat. What I propose is that we go to the second round and either if you prefer, you go back to your own thoughts or if you prefer, you can also go to the chat, read the questions because many of the questions are specifically addressed to specific speakers and, and go ahead and address them. Well, like I said, if you prefer, we can do a second round and then go on to the debate on the questions on the chat. But then I really ask you to please keep to the five minutes because otherwise we won't have time for debate. And this is one of the main things in our webinars is that we do give voice to, to others who are not the speakers, but who are interested and who are dialoguing. Um, we are all dialogue, dialoguing amongst each other. So please do as you feel. If you want to read some of the questions and address them, please do. Of course, there are questions about genetic diversity. Uh, someone asks, Isaac actually asks, uh, would you say, it's a question addressed to Michael, would you say greater genetic diversity brings greater variability, but also population stability and how, etc. Then there's questions for Kobani. Uh, there's also another question about decolonization of anthropology. Can we speak of decolonization of anthropology? So there's, there's several things here. I skipped the one that was addressed to Kobani, which is basically amongst the large numbers of local people whose stories constitute local narratives, local narratives, sorry, <coughs> and who create local knowledge. Which of those narratives and knowledge does one valorize? And what are the consequences of privileging particular individuals' narratives and expressions of knowledge over those of other local people, et cetera? Well, so, okay, let's go to the second round and please do as you, as you wish, either directly addressing some of the questions or going on with your own thoughts. So we'll follow the same order. Michael has the floor. Thank you very much once again. Thank you, Cara. Um, I'm going to try and have some cohesive thoughts, <laughs> but I think that um, the first thing I want to reflect on, um, especially after um, Hania's four points, um, I was thinking about how, you know, my field of biological anthropology was so instrumental in allowing um, empires of the past and modern day governments to have justifications for why certain people deserve rights or deserve access to um, resources over others. Um, they would use biological criteria such as skin color or skull shape and use those as markers for intelligence. And those were not based in any kind of scientific reasoning. Um, now we look back at their studies and we realize that they were selecting skulls or using very arbitrary criteria, um, not in a very empirical way. Uh, and now, of course, we have genetics tell us that, in fact, we are all quite similar genetically, and any differences in race that we see is a social construct and very, very um, tied to the history of um, our political systems and global colonialism. Um, and so, like, you know, after towards uh, the second half of my PhD years, I would then think to myself that, you know, I don't like that my science is tied to this history 100 years ago, um, allowing the earliest colonizers to um, invade and settle in all parts of the world and, um, you know, creating situations like the Holocaust and eugenics movements. Um, so is it possible for science to to, to be used for good. And I think that a large part of that um, has to start off first with recognizing that science is um, apolitical. And in biological anthropology, a lot of people in my field still have a very big problem with acknowledging that. Um, if you take, for example, forensic scientists, they still believe that you can measure skulls and differentiate people by race. Um, if we were to question them like, oh, but what about the fact that all of us are moving nowadays, becoming more globalized, um, migrating everywhere? Does the method still work for people? Does it still work for people who are mixed race? Um, a lot of forensic scientists have a lot of problems with that and will reject that, that challenge because I think a part of that is they're stuck in their ways. And the second part is they're tied 
a lot in a lot of countries to the prison industrial complex and to policing systems that do not want to recognize the fact that they use the arrest of um, and the imprisonment of marginalized communities for their um, capitalistic um, uh, agendas. Um, and so really like biology has such a big impact and uh, on, on uh, as in like what we scientists say is right to do or is acceptable to do or is possible to do with scientific methods has such a big impact on the community because everybody looks to us to tell you how human diversity works or doesn't work. And so I think that, you know, I admire a lot of anthropologists who bring in the social and the political, um, who appreciate the arts and the humanities and what they can tell us about how our science is to be used. Um, the advent of, you know, AI technology, um, machine learning, uh, biological profiling based off of facial recognition, you know, all of these things we, we need you know, really um, a lot of ethical, like uh, people who think a lot about ethics to um, help us through that so that we're not going to use our science or our technology for nefarious means. I also think that um, something that we have to recognize is more of the uh, personal and the emotional and the empathetic aspects of our work. Because as scientists, certainly when I was younger, I was indoctrinated almost um, into believing that science has to be something that is cold and clinical and um, devoid of emotion. But in fact, once you realize the history of our field or the ways that technology is continuing to hurt people or contribute to people's imprisonment or deprivation or um, death, you realize that actually... Um, I mean, I, I can't, I, well, I just personally couldn't imagine not being, uh, getting emotional over that. Um, certainly, like when I was finishing my PhD, it coincided with, you know, the beginning of the COVID pandemic, um, coincided with the death of George Floyd and the, you know, reignition of Black Lives Matter movements all over the world. Um, it made it so hard for me and all my uh, comrades to think about publishing a new paper. I, I couldn't, re I couldn't understand how others could publish three papers a year during 2020 to 2023. How is that possible? How could they not be affected by that and not have that um, affect their work? You know, our work in biological anthropology is already difficult inherently because it's interdisciplinary, bringing history and culture with biology and science. It's international, it's intercultural here in Asia, very complicated. Um, the West is looking to us quite a lot. Um, and I mean that from both directions, from the US, Canada, UK, Europe, and also Australia, New Zealand, from the other, other direction. Um, and we have our own internal politics going on here in Asia as well, as I'm sure you all can appreciate. Um, on top of that, a lot of us are junior. Like right now, I'm in Bangkok with others who are the only people who specialize in human skeletal analysis in each of our countries, Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, Hong Kong, um, Philippines, and we only have each other in this whole region, which has um, over 2 billion people. <laughs> um, and the ethics, working through the ethics uh, and the meaning of our science, you know, I think that after my PhD, I really, and, and what happened in Hong Kong in 2019, made me realize that I don't wanna do work anymore that doesn't save lives. Um, and I believe that I can do work that saves lives as long as my archaeology and anthropology um, helps people gain em empathy and through my through our, our collaborations uh, serve as a ground for cooperation and camaraderie and community building. Devoid of that, um, I don't see the meaning in our work. I think then um, a lot of the, a lot of my other colleagues who don't really see what I'm talking about are really. Um, are really too embedded in in their ways and only see things through a capitalistic colonial they're they're in the grind like the in the academic grind and they've lost their heart and i think at least for me a big part of decolonizing or becoming a more ethical researcher it starts here and if it's here then it goes out there but if it hasn't started here it won't it won't work you can't pretend you you can't fake that i'll leave it there
Thank you so much for this emotional input, which I really think we we have to, to use in anthropology. I totally agree with you. So let's move on to our next guest, which is Giacobani, please. And, and I, I haven't Sean. presented you in the in the second round because I already presented you in the first round. So Michael Rivera's <laughs> from the University of Hong Kong, Jack Kobani is from the University of Johannesburg in South Africa. Please. No problem. Um, thanks a lot, Clara. I hadn't read the chat, but I, I just saw the 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 comment by Professor Magzi, and I I think I'll just respond to that since I I did get in uh, most of what I wanted to say in the in the first rounds uh, of question. I think that um, I'm so happy um, that Prof. Magzi has raised um, this question because that's exactly what this particular project um, that I was reflecting on is 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 is. Um, is 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 trying to think through. I don't want to say address because address says there's a final answer, and I think your question of also problematizing um, who is the local is exactly what I was trying to do um, in my project as a Kosa man researching other Kosa men. So I actually um, absolutely agree um, with your first point, which is that even I, I think what I'm reading from the question is that you are actually asking me and challenging me to actually problematize who who even is the local. And certainly in my last two publications, this is exactly what I do to show not just my disagreement as a Kosa man in relation to the literature, but also showing the ways in which my participants even agree, disagree um, with each other around issues that the literature has assumed are, are, um, are treated homogeneously, um, even amongst people of the same cultural group. So it's absolutely um, true and essential what you're saying. Um, and I think the ways in which we can start by addressing that and something that I'm also trying to do, if you'd see any of my recent publications, um, I literally threw, my, threw myself at the deep end because part of what hasn't been done um, in Southern, Anth Southern African anthropology is to own that incompleteness of ethnography. And that's what I'm trying to say here, which is exactly, I think what is also is hinted at it, that our ethnographies are never complete. Um, even if you might have a direct code recorded verbatim from a person, but for instance, in Kosa, um, depending on the ways in which someone says something, it can mean completely different things, even though it's written um, in the same um, in the same form. So even recorded forms um, miss the nuances of meanings and so on. So I think a starting point for that, um, to, for us to really start to think critically about how we insert local, is to own that even those local narratives, ourselves as ethnographers and the literature are always incomplete. Um, and I think that's what I also write a lot about in some of my work is this notion of epistemic um, humility, because you'd see in my work, I actually criticize myself as well um, around my own assumptions, even though I've been born um, in the same cultural group, same language group, um, grew up in the same schools um, as the people I researched. There's so much that I actually didn't know about my own context. So you can just imagine if you're coming as an ethnographer who doesn't speak the local language and so on. So even as internal people. It's a challenge for us to own the incompleteness. Only one in 10 people have had someone of a different racial group, of a different language group, of a different religious group in their whole household. So a lot of us, um, even as researchers, we come from contexts where we've been exposed predominantly to people of the same homogenous group who speak the same language or the same belief system and so on. And that is often not owned um, in Southern African anthropology. And I'm saying through my work and putting myself um, at the center of it, that we have to really start thinking about um, 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 this own. And part of what we have to own is that um, we cannot avoid the privileging that you referred to um, um, in the question. It is ethnography is always incomplete. So one of the other things I write a lot about is memory. Um, so I read a lot of um, um, authors who write about um, memory. And one of the key things that you would often find in memory studies is that there is no such thing as remembrance. It's always a recreation of what you think you remember. So even ethnography um, um, in many forms relies a lot on our own recreation, which necessarily always means that what we produce is incomplete. It doesn't mean that it can't be useful, but I think in owning the incompleteness and, and, and some of the contributions that we make, we can then start to think about, uh, I think, sorry, I think in owning the sort of um, incompleteness, the, the persistent incomplete, incompleteness of ethnography, I think that can, all, that can help us to get to an ethnography that is not only true, not, not sorry, not true, but an ethnography that gets us as close as to the truth as possible. Um, I'm not an English first language speaker, so my bundles, it's almost six o'clock in South Africa, so English bundles are running out. 
But um, yeah, I think that's the, the best I can answer the question for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kobani. Uh, so now we'll move on to Anthony. Are you there, Tony? I don't know if you prefer Tony or Anthony from the University of Queensland, Australia. There you are. Yeah, thank you. Um, I thought Can you speak a little bit louder, just a yeah, little bit, please? That. Is that better? Is that better now? Can you, uh, uh, how's that? It was that better, better, I think, in the first time. Yeah, I think it's a bit better. Thank you. Okay, great. I, I've, um, I think uh, Gabriella raised a very important point about how we can best protect ourselves from that essentialization of the people that we work amongst. Um, and in my view, our best protection against that temptation is to basically jettison the idea of the bounded human person. Uh, the whole idea that we are a coherent, bounded self. And I find that the people I work with are very amenable to um, accepting the, um, the fragmentary nature of, um, of thought and feeling. Um, and I know there's a tendency to try to avoid seeing others as um, subject to fragmentary states because it can be seen as pathologizing of the other. And yet at the same time, it's very much part of the experiences um, that are uh, related to me and that the, the experiences that I've generated between myself and my interlocutors. And for that reason, I've um, spent quite a lot of time working on the nature of dreams with the people that I work with in regard to trying to get a appreciation of the depth of colonial terror as it's played out in the um, in the Australian landscape. A lot of the people I work with, the older people, um, had very fresh memories of frontier violence and of the continuing uh, violence of the state in their day-to-day -day lives, in um, both from the police force um, and from welfare agencies and general uh, that kind of structural violence of the state. So my work um, in talking to people about their dreams about white people and how we dream about each other has been a really uh, important way of trying to come to an understanding of what um, colonial violence uh, actually um, the effects it has on people and their kin. So uh, despite our tendency to think of dreaming as being something that happens at a very individualized level, it's clear that all social relationships are incredibly intensified in dreams. And to some degree, there is an overlap here with the psychoanalytic view that the diverse personages we encounter in dreams represent aspects of the self. Very much resonates with the interpretations made by many of my Aboriginal friends and colleagues about their dreams. So indigenous dream interpretation often takes strangers um, including anthropologists, to be disguised familiar with whom they share uh, bodily essences. So I found that Kimberley Indigenous dreams about white people can elicit identifications with European power as well as um, acts of deep and radical repugnance to the power of Europeans. So in my view, dreams offer a, a fantastic um, window into the questioning of the very notion of whiteness. And I think it's, um, it's an ongoing project, but what I find is that there are serial identifications in dreams um, about close and more distant kin and it's very often the case that some of the, uh, 
the dreams that have been articulated to me um, and my own dreams that I articulate with the people I live in the small communities with, um, where figures of power um, are readily identified with um, the spirits of the dead. And for that reason, um, uh, colonial figures um, and colonial power can be, it's readily um, interpreted by people in their communal interpretations of dreams um, as um, presenting European strangers as returned figures of the dead and the same sorts of um, both uh, terror and an attempt to actually induce and to rework um, that radical strangeness into familiarity in order to overcome um, that uh, that fear of white power um, is very much a, a resonant part of the, the kind of dream work that's going on. So I found this work with dreams is a really um, useful counterpart to that um, that kind of practical work on land claims and reparations for slavery um, that I was talking about in the early part of the, uh, the early part of this discussion that we're having. So I I do think accepting the inevitable. Uh, fragmentation and the uh, the fact that we are not a single uh, clearly bounded human uh, personality or persona uh, is essential to be uh, able to work around those tendencies to see others as entirely um, bounded. So once again, I'm just keep returning to this relationality and I've been able to kind of build on the work of some um, earlier collections of dreams that were done in the frontier time in the 1930s and, and 1920s in the Kimberley and to build kind of some longitudinal pictures looking at contemporary dreams about white power and how they, what sorts of changes um, have been wrought in in those in that dream work um, and looking at contemporary um, incarnations of white power within um, the indigenous dream work and I found that the Aboriginal people I live with are very keen to um, explore uh, my own dreaming practices with me as well so um, yeah I think I might leave it at that but I do think it's a a remarkable kind of um, sphere of uh, of human existence that opens up onto the whole complexity of um, colonial violence. So. All right, uh, Anthony, thank you so much. You you lost your head there while talking. We couldn't see your head anymore, but I see your back. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much. Um, for all this reflection and I will move on to the second round uh, with Hania Salkami, American University of Cairo in Egypt. Please, Hania, you have the floor. Um, all right. Um, so I, I, I completely agree with Michael with everything he said about this is, should be an ethical project. It has to be a personal project. It has to be one of relevance, and that these were the points I was uh, trying to get through. I'm not talking about all anthropology. Of course, we are all free to do whatever we want, and you know, with and make the most of the the chances we have. But if we're talking about uh, walking back some of this influence that we feel has uh, cast the discipline into a certain mold that masks a power dynamic that creates its own objects, then I I, I'm, I think that everything, what Michael said really, he, he put it very well. Let me go, I, I haven't talked about my work because, um, and I won't, because I, I'm trying to, to, to stick to the topic um, in, in, in a practical way. 
but I mean, it's there's a lot of terrible things that are happening in our discipline. One of these really terrible things is the space we've left behind because it's too vulgar, it's too, uh, it's not sophisticated enough. That space of culture, of personhood, of the social, um, we've left it, but others have, have occupied it. And others from the business HR world to the qualitative research folk to uh, a lot of, uh, of really bad things are happening where the tools that we have uh, uh, created, adopted, so that we that, that have become very sophisticated, just been dropped. And so, my my work is on social policy, for example, and 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 uh, poverty programs in Egypt. Having tried to do something that is to introduce programs that now benefit about twelve million people, I'm very proud of having played that role of bracketing myself as an anthropologist to be a team player to do something that there was an opportunity and to do it in a way that is ethical and that is de-racialized and so on but then to go back and study what i did uh, as an anthropologist and i and i have to say that a anthropologists i've come across are not very interested in this practical world but they also seem not to be bothered by who is occupying the space, you know, by uh, how um, folk in the applied world, whether uh, developing policies or program or in the world of development are just using qualitative methods that are caricaturing that thing we call culture and pretending that there is representation and taking out all the critical and just stepping into the, that space that we've left behind, and I and I find that ethically, it that I I have a a problem with that. Another um, area that we seem to have also um, sort of uh, abandoned is that that world of participation. So we know that participant observation is our tool. And some of the questions in the chat are about valorizing which voice and so on. But, you know, the way we have uh, boiled down participation into the participation of the willing, of the people in the field who are supportive to our projects, or the people in the field that see eye to eye with us, I think is an abandonment of the challenges of participation, of local contestation, of struggle as we encounter it in the local. So by going back from what particip participation should challenge us, that some, at least some of the colleagues who I really respect and love and everything, but have, have decided to participate with like-minded people. And we call that activist anthropology and engaged anthropology. And it's creating, it's reifying a world with the under the, the you know with the guise of uh, participation, and the third one, and I think Michael has talked about it much better than I did, is a humbling uh, project where it's the it's the refusing to um, blow our horn, you know it's the it's the the one the one where we say no I'm I don't want to do that because. Um, you know, it might be great to publish that or it might be important to be in that collection and so on. But I think I'll sit that one out. And I think that that is also that's a third area where uh, there are chances that have are foregone. So that so three things, I think the space left to the um, I call them the vulgar sciences, but they are big and they are. So for example, in Egypt, I can't get a license to do, uh, uh, to be in the field, for example, uh, working with the people I, I'm, I'm currently working with and I have to do it surreptitiously. But uh, anyone who runs a private company that does uh, field work for money, commercial venture can. And they can come up with the goods. The goods is what is the cultural issue here? What is, so, you know, it, th that's a shame. The second is this participation being 
participation that I like rather than participation as um, in a broader, more challenging field. And the third one is the, you know, not sitting out things. So, and I think that these three areas, we we at least own up to the fact that we've kind of, you know, not risen to the challenge of what to do about them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hania. So unfortunately, Khaled has not joined us. So we will have Gabriela again. Gabriela Zamorano from uh, Mexico, please. Thank you, Clara. Uh, well, I would like to pick up on, on some of the uh, ideas that uh, uh, our colleagues have shared. Um, one is that I forgot to mention in the last in the last intervention, but I, I feel is very very relevant, and it's the 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 question of the structural aspect, you know, the allocation of resources. You know, if if we want to talk about um, the colonizing anthropology, um, how do we how can we consider the the, the structural inequalities? Uh, that, uh, you know, allow access. I, I think Michael has talked a lot about this and also the other colleagues. Um, the, the structural uh, 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 limitations that, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, um, have a very, uh, uh, result in a very different, different differentiated access to to education, to, to the production of knowledge, to, uh, to even to, to, to the possibility of exploring um, you know, uh, 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 occupations or uh, 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 space for reflection in, in, in some academic contexts or even in some non-academic contexts. So I think the question of um, the, the structural question is very relevant to, to, to speak about the colonization and, and it's something that uh, we experience in in our in our own uh, contexts in in our, in our own countries and also in, you know in in events like uh, international congress uh, uh, conferences and uh, you know uh, even access to, to 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 specific classrooms or to uh, uh, class loads and all these unequal aspects that are very present in the ways we do anthropology and uh, uh, academic work in the world um the other question I wanna I wanna pick up on uh, is um, what uh, uh, Giovanni mentioned about uh, uh, the the incomplete the incomplete aspect of an ethnography. I was mentioning before that ethnography is a very <laughs> even you know the, the 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 very problematic history of anthropology and the ways anthropology is always having crisis and reflecting. It's given a lot of flexibility to 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 to, to ethnography, and it has a very liberating aspect. Um, I was mentioning uh, ethnography opens the possibility for listening. If you don't listen, you cannot do ethnography. Uh, for opening up dialogues, uh, for for uh, following up processes. Uh, sometimes I I am a bit uh, suspicious when um, uh, uh, some anthropological uh, uh, research. Um, Kind of celebrates that uh, 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 that that the success of a uh, of a uh, the colonizing uh, process, and I would like to rather focus on the process and uh, analyzing like the, the the fissures, the contradictions, and not to to arrive to celebrating uh, the uh, the success of 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 of, uh, of a result. And I think one of these um, kind of liberating aspects of ethnography is. It's incompleteness. Uh, uh, the fact that, as 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 uh, uh, said, in terms of memory, it's always incomplete. It's always, um, you know, you, you reconstruct from fragments, and that's what fieldwork does, and that's what our knowledge can do. And if we acknowledge that uh, uh, our knowledge production is always in process and incomplete and sometimes contradictory, it's kind of liberating because it opens the possibility for. Um, for uh, for not having to tell a final truth, no, I like that aspect a lot. Um, I was also well um, thinking uh, about uh, yeah the the emotional 
uh, and the, the on the one hand the, the emotional aspect but very uh, related to the to the commitment and to the ethical aspect of doing research and i totally agree that um, uh, this aspect uh, uh, is very relevant and has also a lot of challenges because for example when we talk about collaboration um, um how can the can one push collaboration without um overseeing the power processes that are involved in the fact that I arrive as an anthropologist, as an academic, working with a, a group of people and pretending that we are doing kind of equal collaboration when this doesn't really happen. So um, um, I don't know, I, I am very uh, motivated by, the, by, by a lot of the, the, the points that uh, my colleagues have brought about. Um, I was listening to Hania about uh, how sometimes um, uh, in, in in anthropology, we kind of overlook the the vulgar or the or, or some kind of very ordinary aspects of uh, political and social life. And how can we pay attention to that? No, uh, uh, I think it, it, that for me is in the realm of subjectivities. How can we um, uh, 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 um, explore and research political subject the, the formation of political subjectivities in fields that are not kind of that are not paid attention to like uh, for example I, I look at popular photography no how people in their ordinary lives include uh, you know produce photographies pr produce images uh, uh, and uh, circulate them in in social networks and how this very kind of ordinary uh, producing a lot of um, uh, social senses, a lot of social meanings, uh, 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 even political responses. No, so I, I, I also think that this aspect of looking at kind of vulgar, ordinary, non-relevant aspects of social life can uh, 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 can indeed result into or, uh, original and and relevant fields to to, to study and to uh, to look at other things that are usually looked at in in more classical uh, things. You know. So that's it. Thank you so much, Gabriela. So we've had views from Hong Kong, from South Africa, from Australia, from Cairo, and now from Mexico. And since the original question was, how do you as an anthropologist think or see decolonizing anthropology coming from a specific country or a region in the world? I think you've all pretty much addressed, but of course we have a, such a huge range of subtopics that have been addressed and, and discussed here. I think we could now move on more to the to the chat questions. I know that some of you have already uh, answered or at least addressed some of the questions that came up in the chat. We have, for instance, another one from Jacobo Tossi from the Universita de Bologna who says, uh, is it really possible to speak of a decolonization of anthropology without first carrying out a decolonization of education, crystallized in the history of Western universities, most of which are totally incorporated into the capitalist logic of bailing at any cost? I think this question of the relationship with the teaching system has partially been addressed by Hania, right? Uh, because you, you did, you did speak about this inequalities and this uh, colonization uh, in, in many countries as in yours uh, by external powers or by external capitalism. But still, you know, if any of you, of course, wants to address or go further into this, please. And also there's another question here, once again, from Muggsy, who asks, uh, who is it that regards seeing the other people as fragmentary as pathologizing them? Uh, this question is actually particularly addressed uh, at Anthony, uh, but Muggsy goes on asking, is that perspective not itself one requiring decolonization? And also those of us who uncritically hear that critique. Um, then there's some um, comments on Hania's, um, Hania's talk about, about the caretaking of some of the concepts we have abandoned. So I don't know, does any one of you want to address or answer? Well, there's one question directly directed directed at, at Anthony, but then the other one is, I suppose, 
not only Hania, but it could be addressed while Michael is raising his hand. So we'll move on like this now. If anyone wants to speak, please let, raise their hand. So Michael, please. And then Anthony. Michael, you have the floor. For those so, who went uh, to Michael is a, a biological anthropologist from the University of Hong Kong. Please. Go. So this question about like um, uh, you know, decolonial approaches or appro uh, or uh, moving towards decoloniality in anthropology is very interesting when you talk about education, um, especially because I'm um, all my life pretty <laughs> feels like all my life, but you know since um for for many years now always been in a university setting. And um, I remember like after I finished my PhD and came back to Hong Kong, I really, or came back to Asia in general, I felt the great sense of responsibility because suddenly it wasn't me who was, um, you know, learning from mentors, but suddenly I was the mentor or the leader or the manager <laughs> of knowledge and what gets disseminated to our uh, junior junior members who, who really want to um, learn more anthropology. And I feel like there are definitely things that <clears throat> that I that my boss knows that I teach because it's on the syllabus. And then there's stuff that my bosses do not know I teach because it's not on the syllabus. And <laughs> um, I definitely am um, also very careful about how I do that. And we have lots of, um, you know, safe space, closed room discussions about the problems with academia, with the problems of um, the problems of uh, my field in particular, uh, of looking at genes and bones and skin and uh, and and also, you know, cultural artifacts. Um, the fact that lots of the museums that we that hold interesting artifacts and human remains uh, continue not to repatriate their um, their their items back to the communities of origin, for example. Um, the fact that there is still a lot of power dynamics in research. Um, the fact that you know a lot of our uh, papers that would make the top science journals like Nature, or Science, or you know biological anthropology journals tend to be from a certain background, um, certain demographics, and you know I I really don't <clears throat> I really don't see the point of um, a very slow process of diversifying our field because um, I think a big part of decolonizing uh, at least my science is to allow more scientists from all kinds of backgrounds from former colonies to participate and then actually to work together. You know, this week where I'm amongst a, a whole bunch of other Southeast Asian scientists is very interesting for me because, because for the first time, I, I, I feel like I am working through a lot of questions that I've had for 15 years in my discipline. I'm so used to the canon, but here it is where we're actually um, in a safe space where we can challenge each other on the interpretations of the data. And we're doing it empathetically and we welcome broader ranges of perspectives. You know, Asian people don't all think the same <laughs> about our past. And even if you get two people from Hong Kong, we don't see things the same way either. I feel like it's it's you know the divide and conquer strategy that um the more senior scientists in my field have have utilized for so such a long time so anyway about education i break that down for the students and um i make sure that they know that we're we're working towards a different direction not sure if anyone else has any other ideas about that well let's see uh Tony had raised his hand and so did Kobani. So let's go in order. Tony, please. Yeah. Look, uh, just briefly in regard to um, Magdi's uh, good question there, I think there has been a tendency to, uh, in progressive attempts to kind of restore the integrity of, um, of colonized persons' value, there's a uh, there's a a disturbing tendency within that to talk about the um, the inherent integrity of of uh, of colonized people um, because a lot of the discourse leading up to that um, had often adopted a infantilizing um, view of colonized people and so i've been quite i think um the 
the black American um, uh, writer Fred Moten, I find very interesting on this subject, where he he talks about uh, his concept of the undercommons, and he says the very idea of a settled individual, a kind of possessive ownership of self, is dangerous and is a barrier to being together lovingly, as he puts it. And I, he he very much celebrates um, the aspects of being homeless, of being unsettled, of being unruly, and of um, the, the great value of play. And it's uh, I think it's that kind of I think Moten puts it much better than I can in that respect. And I, it's um, it is a it's a good counterpart to these attempts to these restorative attempts of a colonized subjectivity that um, progressive um, progressive uh, Europeans tend to want to um, revalue um, in their critiques of um, the colonial process so and I find it um, very interesting that um, people like what Fred Moten is saying in that regard. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, Jacobari, please. Oh, um, thanks a lot, Clara. And certainly thank you so much, um, Gabriela, for your, for your intervention. I was really touched by this notion of um, the, the potential of incompleteness. And I will definitely be referencing that for, for so many other papers I do. Um, I raised my hand because um, I think I sent the uh, my colleagues an email that <laughs> I have a power cut in like 10 minutes. So I wanted to just um, contribute to this point of um, the anthropology of um, education. Um, and I think one of the, so I, I cited Motseme, whose um, sort of definition I love of um, decolonization as a new way of seeing, but I, I sort of didn't continue. She continues to say also that um, decolonization is also the struggle um, against alienation. And I just wanted to sort of plug um, some of the work we've been doing as an association, as ASNA, to try to make um, the discipline as well as the education of anthropology a more um, 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 what, what are, I guess what we call trauma sensitive or trauma um, um, informed um, association. And I just want to read three comments from the last conference that we have. And the first one came from someone who has, who's been in the discipline um, for nearly 20 to 25 years. I really don't know the exact number. And she said for the first time after attending this conference, uh, the 2023 conference, she feels that this is for the first time that anthropology is a discipline that is worth fighting for. The second comment came from a young Black student who told us that um, this is the first conference that they've attended where the post-conference debrief was not about the trauma they experienced from senior scholars who bullied them at the conference, but they were debriefing um, ideas and critiquing each other in ways that were humanizing. And the last one was around um, a young person who also said this is a caring conference. And I promise I'm not making this up. If you search the hashtag ASNA 2023, these are all public. And we didn't ask any of these young people to read, write about. But one of the things that made me remember this in relation to education is, of course, I've been writing a lot as well um, on trauma-informed care pedagogy in anthropology. And we have a paper with some of my students, a collective memoir of our experiences, both the good as well as the healing experiences we've had. We'll be in teaching anthropology next year. And I've been writing also a lot about um, rehumanization um, and the possibility, I think that links to um, your profound com comment, Gabriel, around the possibility of really rehumanizing um, the discipline and really changing it around. So I'm just sort of sharing this to say that there are definitely ways in which, um, and I've certainly been witness to it um, just three months ago when we held um, our annual conference. And I wanted to read a quote from you from Gin Wright, who's one of my favorite authors who writes about education and so on. And she writes about this notion of healing-centered engagement, um, which I've been trying to promote as well in anthropology in my classes, as well as the association. 
Um, and um, they write that um, healing-centered engagement is akin to the South African term Ubuntu. Ubuntu means I recognize my humanity through you. It means that humaneness is found through our interdependence, collective engagement, and our service to others. The healing-centered approach, um, which I argue is necessarily in, uh, in anthropology, comes from the idea that we are not he we are not um, harmed in a vacuum in anthropology, um, but and therefore our healing cannot happen in isolation. It comes from us sharing our stories in platform as this, in our associations, in our conferences, and holding space to be able to hear each other's pain, joy, and suspending, of course, um, judgment, uh, the holism that we promote in anthropology. And I also want to just say, in case my power goes out and I don't have another opportunity to talk, we're hosting the World um, Anthropological Union um, Inaugural Congress um, in uh, November next year. Um, along with our Anthropology Southern African um, um, Conference. And you'll see the theme actually, which we're gonna release on Friday is on repair. So we are continuing to think about these conversations of how do we, is it even possible actually to we ask provocatively as you'll see in the call for papers, can we actually repair um, the discipline of anthropology? And I think, um, um, I hope um, in all these people who are here, you will be, you will be joining us um, in Johannesburg next year in November to think more about this. But um, yeah, I'll be here, but um, I might jump up. Sure. No uh, problem, uh, Giacobani, uh, thank you so much. So, thank you so much. Anyway, we, we've been here almost two hours, one hour, 50 minutes. So we have tops, 10 more minutes tops because our webinars always take one and a half hour to two hours maximum. So th there was another question on the chat directed at Gabriella. I don't know if you read it. It, it asks something like, let me see. La, 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 la. My question goes to Gabi, so it's Gabriela, on how she understands the collaboration between the local narrative and how the image circulates in other contexts that can serve uprooted from their context or manipulated for colonial narratives. Yeah, this goes, she's a, she's a student, she says, from Muned, Spain. And yes, she's, she's uh, studying anthropology and photography. So, Gabriela, I don't know if you would like to answer this, although you've addressed the issue. Before. Yeah, I'll, I'll go. I'll try to be brief. Thank you, Clara, and thank you, Tania, for the question. This is one of my favorite topics. Uh, I I work a lot with um, uh, archives, like photograph, visual archives, photography archives, film archives, and um, um, this this question of of rooting archives from their context uh, uh, of power. I found following a lot of colleagues, a lot of people who are working on this, even on the field of cinema, for example, cine film production, um, I find it very liberating to 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 work with an archive example that was intended, that was produced within a specific power context. For example, was intended to uh, establish um, some kind of segregation, some kind of racial statements or arguments, and um, if you bring, we've worked with other colleagues trying to to open up those archives, to returning those archives to the communities where they were produced, and see what people do with them nowadays. So, uh, and um, in the um, people interaction with uh, the contemporary people's interaction with our, those archives, um, um, allows those people to to learn other things from their histories, from the liberate uh, the, the the context the power context in, in which they were created so i think uh, uh, there is a very powerful uh, 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 potential of uh, working with historical images or even contemporary images and um, put them in circulation in other ways in order to create different and more liberating narratives so i think that's um, I think that has a, a strong potential. That's my point, and I, and that's that's an experiment I do throughout my work uh, all the time uh, with uh, photographic exhibits, with uh, uh, workshops. You know, putting people uh, uh, just opening space for people to play with images and to create different narratives um, to 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 those that were initially created. Uh, Thank you so much, Gabriela. So I, I don't know, we have a few minutes left only. I don't know if Hania uh, wants to give her input from Cairo. <laughs> uh, I, I'd just like to thank everyone. Um, and 
make a plea for this decolonizing uh, trend to not attempt to be hegemonic, to be a minority, because I think hegemony is unethical. So if we do, there's a contradiction there between wanting to be to decolonize, um, which is an, an ethical project, but really it cannot be hegemony because we we ethically speaking, I think it's better to be weak than strong. Um, but that's my my position. And really, thank you, Clara. And it's it's been a pleasure hearing everyone and crossing so many borders and boundaries and uh, of geography and age and, and gender. And I've learned a lot. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much to everyone. Uh, I, I really I'm just sorry that Khaled Furani uh, from Palestine could not be here with us today. I don't know what happened. But anyway, uh, I want to wish you all a good morning, good afternoon or good night, whether you're in Australia, since it's already the 29th, I think, or good night in Hong Kong or afternoon in, in Johannesburg or, or, or in, Pal well, in Palestine, Khaled's not here, but in Egypt and uh, probably late morning in Mexico, right? So um, I really want to thank you all very much. Also to all the people who engage in conversation with us through the chat. Uh, we were uh, being watched on streaming and Facebook for by over 200 people. So that was that had a huge impact. And I think it's that's one of the roles of WCA and of WOW, uh, World Anthropological Union, is that we anthropologists can dialogue. And well, I don't know, we had this terrible thing, which was the pandemic, but actually the pandemic taught us that we don't need to take planes and uh, <laughs> do bad things to, to the environment to be able to connect and to debate amongst ourselves. So Zoom is good for that, or Zoom or other, any other platform. Uh, and, and so we are holding this uh, webinars not normally every two months. So the next one will take place probably in early February on the theme of artificial intelligence, which is also a hot topic that connects with anthropology also. So Thank you once again to all the participants, to everyone with what that was with her with us. Uh, you will be able to re-watch this uh, webinar because it will be posted on the WOW uh, WCA website. Uh, not immediately, but within the next few days. And uh, thank you once again to our colleague Ricardo Faguagua, who's the IT master in this. I'm not, I'm terrible on the on the issue, but Thank you so much. And uh, we hope to see you in the next webinars and have a nice ending or beginning of day. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. Bye. Very nice Thank meeting you. Bye, Anthony. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Great to meet you all. I look forward to uh, further discussion. Okay, bye. 3 a.m. Bye. Here. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Yeah.